Uh, this morning we're going to kind of review current medical and surgical management of pituitary adenomas. Um, I thought that this would be a, a good review for the fellows and some of the other uh, providers that don't routinely uh, work with these patients. I don't have any disclosures. So, you know, as we know, the, the pituitary is the master gland, um, basically con under the control of the hypothalamus, and uh, the anterior pituitary is a true gland where uh, hormones are synthesized and released, as opposed to the posterior pituitary, where they're synthesized up in the hypothalamus, but then stored and released from the posterior pituitary. And um, for those of you who uh, have recently taken your written boards, you probably remember that it's the dorsomedial and the ventromedial nuclei that are primarily in control of the anterior pituitary. Um, and uh, we have three different parts uh, of the anterior. I think the one thing that's important to remember is the, the pars tuberalis is basically where the gonadotropes focus. And the gonadotropes are not actually uh, derived from pituitary tissue. They're derived from yolk sac. So they migrate uh, during embryogenesis uh, to form the pars tuberalis of the pituitary. So that is not... It is a true gland because those are where the hormones are synthesized, but it's not derived from Rathke's pouch. Uh, and so we have six anterior and two posterior um, sets of hormones. And we have this historic um, H and E classification for the different types. And, and this is something that still appears on both written and oral boards. So the acidophils are your mammosomatotrophs, secreting growth hormone and prolactin. Uh, your basophils are your gonadotropes, uh, your thyrotropes and your corticotropes, and then the chromophobes or the so-called null cells. And um, what's interesting is if you look at the pathology, the histopathology of quote-unquote null cell or non-functioning pituitary adenomas, most of them are actually gonadotrope, silent gonadotrope um, adenomas. They're not true null cell tumors. Uh, there is a um, sort of homotopic grouping of these cells, and this plays out in how you see the presentation of some of these tumors. So the um, thyrotropes and corticotropes tend to be centered in the anteromedian wedge of the pituitary, and this means that you can have involvement of both sides. Uh, the growth hormone, the acromegalax, tend to be anterolateral, and the prolactin secreting tumors tend to be posterior. And if you look at the MRIs, and we'll show this in some case examples, prolactin secreting tumors, similar to Rathke's cleft cysts, tend to have a rim of pituitary tissue, normal pituitary tissue, in front of them before you actually reach the tumor. They don't typically erupt to the surface. Uh, so we'll use uh, Cushing's disease as a model um, and spend a little bit more time on pathophysiology and normal feedback loops uh, for the pituitary before we dive into some of the other disease states. So Cushing's disease, um, almost one and a half to two and a half million cases per year are diagnosed. And worldwide, there's a prevalence of almost 40 million cases at any given time. Uh, typically diagnosed in the third decade, and there is a strong preponderance of female over male patients with this. And the male patients with Cushing's tend to be older at the time of diagnosis than the female patients. Um, and there's usually a delay in diagnosis. This tends to be a, a somewhat insidious onset to this disease. And a lot of times, as these people are approaching middle age, people will chalk up the weight gain and the hypertension and the diabetes just to lifestyle and American diet. Um, but there is a very strong mortality hazard ratio associated with this disease state. Uh, and even after a complete biochemical cure, the cardiovascular deleterious effects uh, last for more than five years. So the sooner you diagnose it, the sooner you manage it, uh, the better the patient's going to do. Uh, 
I think one of the things that's confusing for surgeons and non-surgeons alike is the whole screening process and diagnostic process for Cushing's disease. Um, and current diagnostic criteria, screening consists of at least two or more positive tests. So a single positive screening test, such as a fasting AM a cortisol, a random cortisol, a midnight salivary cortisol, a 24-hour urinary free cortisol. All of these are screening tests that are used, and you have to have at least two because uh, you can get false positives. And one of the first um, forks in the road, so to speak, uh, is looking at the serum uh, ACTH level. So you pass your screening tests, and that gets you to Cushing's syndrome. Cushing's syndrome is simply an elevation in circulating cortisol and the associated um, somatic changes and disease states that are associated with it doesn't prove that it's a central source. In order to have Cushing's disease, it has to be due to an excess of secretion of ACTH from a pituitary adenoma. So the, the first fork is checking a serum ACTH level. And if it's suppressed, that means that the normal feedback pathway is working and that the excess cortisol is exogenous, either from a uh, adrenal cortical tumor um, uh, is most likely. Occasionally, some of the uh, lung masses can uh, more likely produce ACTH, very rarely produce cortisol, um, versus an elevated where it's ACTH dependent. And so then you have to decide is it ectopic ACTH secretion, like you see with small cell lung, uh, or is it of a pituitary source? And that's where the dexamethasone suppression testing comes into play. So um, you can do high-dose dex suppression testing with 8 mg uh, of dexamethasone. And the reason we use dexamethasone as opposed to prednisone or Cortef is that dexamethasone will initiate the feedback loop, um, but it's not detected by the assay that the lab uses to measure serum cortisol levels, whereas the other steroids are. So you give somebody prednisone and you check their serum cortisol, you're actually measuring their blood concentration of prednisone. Uh, DEX is not picked up by the assay. Uh, and so what you should see, because e even though these are neoplastic lesions that are secreted in excess of ACTH, if they can secrete ACTH, they typically retain some of the feedback mechanisms. You give them a high enough dose, you should see a 50% drop in their serum cortisol as a result of that you can get a 20% false negative rate. You can also do CRH stim, so you can move one step higher along the hypothalamic uh, pituitary axis, and they should also respond uh, with gusto to a CRH stim test. CRH, unfortunately, is difficult to obtain these days pharmaceutically, um, but you should see a 50% jump in uh, ACTH, serum ACTH levels peripherally, 20% uh, uh, increase in cortisol, and you can get a 10% false negative, so even the ectopics can respond to ACTH. Um, not infrequently, we end up down here at petrosal sinus sampling, which is, uh, I think, an imperfect science at best. It is operator dependent. Uh, both in terms of the angiographer, but also in terms of the lab techs that are collecting these. It's important that the timing uh, of these is correct, that the specimens are labeled correctly. That's probably the most frequent error is that the specimens are mislabeled. Um, but basically what you're doing here is snaking a catheter up into the inferior petrosal sinus on, on both sides, a super selective catheterization. And they, you're also collecting peripheral blood, and you're measuring gradients between central and peripheral. So you're, it's very good at proving central source. Uh, and then in theory, you can look at lateralization, but uh, in practice, it's probably about a coin toss in terms of how accurate it is. I don't know if Steve or Akshal or Cam, you have any other experiences with that, but I've... I've been reassured by it proving a central source, but I've never been reassured by laterality. So, so uh, at Oldfield, um, 
was the first in the world to describe it, the NIH, with um, several hundred patients. Uh, and at UVA, he stopped doing it. Um, and basically, you're absolutely right. It comes down to it's good for determining a central source, but in terms of lateralization, um, if the monkey chose the side, uh, you'd only do slightly better with IPSS. So the the predictive value for central versus peripheral is greater than 95%. The predictive value for lateralization, some people say, Ed Oldfield's original paper said 70%. I think it's probably closer to 50 to 60. Um, and I'm not going to get into the imaging today. Maybe uh, we'll get Dr. Sasanto to come in and do some Im neuroimaging of paracellular lesions. Um, so we're going to jump to the role of surgery, uh, and we'll also talk about some of the medical therapy. So um, surgery remains the treatment of choice in Cushing's disease. Um, depending on whose series you're looking at, anywhere from 70 to 90 percent of patients will um, achieve a biochemical cure with their first operation. There is a small subset that have delayed remission where there may be some residual tissue that eventually necrosis and dies. And so four, six, eight weeks later, uh, even though they didn't have an initial cure by current criteria, which is any nadir less than two nanograms per deciliter of serum cortisol, uh, they do come back later on and they are cured. Um, morbidity depends on the complication and this is ignoring microscopic versus endoscopic overall, still about an 8 to 9% CSF uh, leak rate in these cases, which is interesting because they're microadenomas as opposed to macros. Um, but a lot of it has to do with the fact that oftentimes you're uh, exploring multiple areas of the gland rather aggressively, and the, the cell isn't expanded, the diaphragm is low. And there's a lot of manipulation, which often leads to an iatrogenic tear in the diaphragm. Um, SIDH and central DI are common. The overall mortality reported is about 1.5% to 2%. Um, so here's an example of a, a selective resection. So these can be uh, removed on block, and this is similar to the uh, pseudocapsular dissection technique. Uh, that Dr. Oldfield also published based on his experience at the NIH and is currently the gold standard uh, for resection of a Cushing's adenoma. And so because these are, tend to be microadenomas, oftentimes the Sinuses are still competent. They haven't been uh, they haven't been compressed over time. There's often a couple of venous lakes in the dura, but you can see working here with a hardy curette around this adenoma and it coming out. This was a more firm one. Oftentimes they're sort of milky and they don't come out easily. And there's there's the adenoma, and you can see. Dura, the back wall there, and bleeding from the cavernous sinus. Um, as I mentioned, not all patients are cured, so um, second surgery is still strongly considered for these patients, probably about a coin flip or the monkey's choice, as Steve put it, uh, with a second surgery. Um, radiosurgery is a very viable alternative. Uh, there is a delay to the onset of, of management, but it is good. Uh, if you look at the UVA data for SRS, it's about 50% remission uh, with SRS. If you look at fractionated radiotherapy, LINAC therapy, it's all over the map, but on average about the same. Uh, the big risk with doing this is that it's non-selective, so it's just as good at killing normal pituitary tissue as it is at killing the adenoma. Oftentimes with brittle uh, or malignant Cushing's disease, that may be preferable. It may be preferable to have the patient on replacement therapy for the remainder of their hormones, uh, but cure them of their excess. 
Medical management primarily is used for patients while they're in the waiting period until radiation takes effect um, and or patients who are not good surgical candidates. Um, and then the definitive management, which we rarely use these days, is bilateral adrenalectomy. It's 100% effective, but it carries about a 10% complication rate, uh, both from the surgery itself and developments of Nelson syndrome. So you have circulating excess of ACTH, and there are medical complications associated with that because you lose the feedback loop. Uh, current uh, medical therapies, so these are all the current ones that are uh, the approved um, or use off-label. So you have steroidogenesis inhibitors, and ketoconazole is probably the, the most commonly used one, so this is an inadvertent effect of an anti-helminthic agent. Uh, automidate, uh, which also inhibits the production of excess steroid. Um, and then you have uh, use of cabergoline, which is typically what we use for prolactin, but there is some D2 receptor-mediated secretion of ACTH. So typically with cabergoline, you can get a, a small, maybe a 10 to 20% reduction in their circulating cortisol, but it doesn't cure them. Uh, Passereotide, some uh, SOM 230, which is the investigational name of the drug, is a selective somatostatin uh, receptor agonist, so that downregulates um, the secretion of ACTH. And uh, the uh, somatostatin receptor 2 is the most common one uh, that appears in this disease state. Um, this is on market. It says here currently investigational, but it is available on market. It's labeled for use in acromegaly. It's an off-label use for Cushing's, and they currently uh, have post-market studies going on looking at its use. And then mifepristone is a glucocorticoid receptor agonist, so this is similar to uh, using downstream growth hormone receptor blockers to try to block the downstream effects, but it doesn't actually lower the circulating cortisol levels. Oftentimes, a combination of those medications will be used. Dr. York. Um, so it varies from individual to individual. It depends if it's a image positive or image negative Cushing's. And um, uh, it also depends on what we did at the first surgery. So if it's image positive, you go in, you resect the, the lesion that appears on MRI, but not necessarily explore the rest of the gland. And that comes back negative for ACTH staining, which is possible. You can have a collision lesion. Obviously, that's a patient you're going to go back and you're going to explore the rest of the gland. If you resect an adenoma that shows up on MRI and it tests ACTH positive, um, but you didn't explore the cavernous sinus, you didn't explore the remainder of the gland, that may be a good candidate to go back. Um, I had a patient recently with an image positive that clearly on imaging invaded the cavernous sinus, used angled scopes to get into the cavernous sinus to chase it, um, but was not biochemically cured. I'm not going to go exploring the rest of the gland because odds are there's something hiding somewhere in the cavernous sinus that I'm not going to get. However, that would be a good patient to consider radiating unilaterally, preserving the contralateral side of the gland, and targeting really the cavernous sinus to kill the tissue there. Uh, in a patient who's image negative, uh, and you've done a hemihypophysectomy maybe based on IPSS results, and you didn't find anything obvious at surgery, that's somebody that you know is going to be floridly Cushingoid and you'd have to have a long, frank discussion about what the best treatment for them. Oftentimes, I'm, I think that the risks of ongoing Cushing's are higher than the risks of panhypopituitarism because we can replace all the hormones. And that would be somebody that I would probably say, let's just radiate the cella, get their Cushing's under control, and then put them on replacement. <laughs> 
Steve or Akshal, any? Yeah, yeah. I, right. You know, and you, unfortunately, we don't have good intraoperative assays, right? So the holy grail would be either an intraoperative histology that could prove that the adenoma you just pulled out on frozen was ACTH staining, or even better, look at circulating ACTH or cortisol levels similar to doing parathyroid hormone during parathyroid surgery. And you look at parathyroid hormone levels and calcium levels during the surgery to decide whether or not you've actually resected it. The problem is, is that nobody's ever been able to demonstrate correlation. Steve? I was going to say, Ludica is a, is a guy that tried doing that with circulating ACTH um, and did serial levels during the surgery to prove um, resection, but it's not 100% reliable. For the MR negatives, uh, Oldfield's technique was just dissecting the um, the gland with linear incisions with an 11 blade um, and exploring the gland uh, completely. Um, and with that technique, um, you can pick up adenomas in his hands of two or three millimeters. Um, but any time we did those, it was very hard for the amateur uh, for us to see what he you know was taken out till he taken it out and I think you can only do that when you've done a thousand. It's yeah, so for image negative, I use a similar technique where I divide the gland into four parts. I'll make a midline incision uh, into the gland, and if everything's negative and I don't find anything, that's going to be demarcation for my hemihypophysectomy. And then I divide each hemisphere into halves. Um, and I use something similar to an 11 blade, but same idea. And oftentimes, uh, with a round knife or a Kappa Bianca dissector, which is similar to a Roten 4, um, if there is a pocket, uh, even if you don't get a pseudocapsular dissection, because I have not mastered the pseudocapsular dissection of an image negative microadenoma, you can at least uh, feel a loss of resistance as you fall into a pocket of tumor. Um, and that's typically where you get a little bit of wispy, milky looking stuff. Um, but yeah, I would say that it is definitely operator dependent. Any other questions about Cushing's? Uh, so current management of prolactin secreting adenomas. Um, so this is the one situation where medical management is the primary therapy and surgery is reserved for people who fail medical management. Um, and the reason for this is you get normalization of the biochemical abnormality and reduction in tumor burden um, and normalization of, of the gonadal axis. So you can restore a normal menstrual cycle, you can restore fertility. Uh, in men, you can restore testosterone levels. Uh, the two classic agents that are used are both um, dopamine agonists Bromocryptine is a mixed D1 antagonist, D2 agonist. Cabergoline is more selective. This is a D2 agonist. D2 receptors are the subtype that's used here. Uh, also uh, used in uh, management of, well, these agents aren't used, but the D2 receptor is involved with the cognitive pathways involved in behavior disorders and uh, psychiatric disorders, including schizophrenia. So you don't want to give these agents, you don't want to give a D2 agonist to a schizophrenic. You're just going to induce a problem. Um, these are pretty effective for microadenomas, for a, a pituitary prolactinoma less than 10 millimeters, uh, 90 plus percent effective. When you start getting into the macroadenoma, and especially the cystic macroadenoma range, uh, the efficacy drops. So we consider surgery for these patients if they're intolerant to the dopamine agonist. Some people get orthostatic hypotension. A lot of people will get bad GI upset and not be able to tolerate it just because they can't eat and they'll be nauseous. Uh, if somebody develops pituitary apoplexy with acute optic compromise, that would be an indication to operate. Um, 
women who are uh, wishing to uh, restore uh, fertility prior to um, uh, so-called cure, um, the cystic ones I mentioned. And occasionally you can get patients that need surgery because they had a giant prolactinoma that um, shrunk down with therapy and they develop a CSF leak as a result of the tumor going away. And as I mentioned, the psychiatric patients. So the outcomes are good, less than 10 millimeter lesion, uh, 80 to 90% cure rate uh, with surgery. Uh, macros, only about 50%. And a lot of this is because these macros tend to invade the cavernous sinus. And once you violate the wall of the cavernous sinus, it becomes much more difficult to get every last little bit of biochemically active tumor. So here's an example of a, sorry, here's an example of a selective uh, prolactinoma resection. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, these prolactinomas tend to appear behind a rim of normal gland. So you can see posteriorly is the adenoma, anteriorly is normal gland. And you'll see over here as I play this video um, that we're going to actually make uh, an incision with the scissors through normal gland to get to uh, the abnormal tissue. You could also extensively open along the floor uh, and try to lift it up. But in my experience, if you get a CSF leak, it makes the reconstruction very difficult. So making a small incision through a lip of tumor and then working behind that lip with semi-blunt instruments to do a pseudocapsular dissection, in a moment you'll see the tumor kind of pop out. And these prolactinomas and the, gonad uh, the growth hormone secreting ones have this very bright white appearance compared to the normal gland. So there's the tumor popped out. Acromegaly, this is an interesting beast because this is a place where there's a role for simultaneous medical and surgical management. Um, for adenomas that are confined to within the cella, you'll find cure rates anywhere from 75 to 95%. I think, you know, 75 to 80% is probably realistic. If it becomes invasive into the cavernous sinus or expands supracellularly, uh, that drops. However, there's still a role for surgery because if you can get uh, to a quarter or less of the original tumor burden, then the long-acting somatostatin analogs have better effect in terms of managing the biochemical disease. Um, and if you have giant adenomas, which oftentimes with these you do, then your surgical cure rate drops below 40%. Things to keep in mind is that uh, similar to Cushing's, there are a lot of medical comorbidities in acromegalic patients. There's a higher mortality incidence and primarily due to either airway issues uh, or cardiomyopathies. So these people will have a lot of pharyngeal and laryngeal edema because of their growth hormone excess. They often have sleep apnea uh, and it's something that the anesthesiologist needs to be aware of. They also develop a dilated high output cardiomyopathy and so all my acromegalic patients, I will send for a cardiology eval and full cardiac function testing before surgery, even if they don't have any symptoms. So if they have the diagnosis of acromegaly, they get a cardiac workup. And in a moment, hopefully the slide will change. I'm not frozen. There we go. So here's an example. Here's a small, so a microadenoma with invasion into the cavernous sinus. So you'll see here we've opened bone out over cavernous sinus doing a pseudocapsular dissection. And as soon as this tumor comes out, you'll see uh, bleeding from the cavernous sinus and oftentimes we'll be looking at, sorry, looking at the wall of the carotid. You can see here the developing a nice plane between where the gland is. We're not dissecting between gland and tumor here. We're actually dissecting between medial wall of cavernous sinus uh, and tumor. So this was contained entirely within the cavernous sinus.
sometimes hard to tell that uh, preoperatively if it doesn't completely encase the carotid or at least start to come around the carotid. So now tumor's out, and, and this is 30 degrees, you're looking laterally, and that's carotid sitting right there. So we've opened the compa medial compartment of the cavernous sinus and have skeletonized uh, the carotid. So if it's, if it's dark, that's carotid right there. Is it a funny video, John? Uh, radio surgery is often used uh, for residuals, uh, again, uh, most commonly out in the cavernous sinus. The cure rate is a little bit worse than it is for Cushing's disease. So eventually you can normalize the growth hormone levels in about 50% of patients. But the interesting thing about um, acromegaly as opposed to Cushing's is that it's not just the absolute level, it's the circadian rhythm of secretion of growth hormone that regulates the production of IGF. So even if you normalize the level, if you don't restore the normal pulsatility of growth hormone, you'll have excess IGF-1, which is why the IGF-1 levels normalize in fewer patients. And just like with Cushing's disease, you radiate these patients, uh, more than 50% of them will be panhypopit after about three years. Um, Medical management, sometimes these are used pre-surgically if we're going to uh, need to delay for management of cardiac issues. Um, there has not been any evidence that pre-treatment or neoadjuvant treatment with somatostatin receptor ligands improves the surgical outcome, but it does manage the medical problems while they're waiting for surgery. Uh, and a lot of patients will still need this after surgery. As I mentioned, if you can get more than 75% of the tumor debulked, these work better. Arctreotide is the classic one. It's a nonspecific somatostatin ligand, and only about 20% of patients will improve with this. There's a long-acting, almost like a depo form, uh, which is typically given once a week or once a month, and um, that you get up to a, a 40 to 50% cure rate with. And then you can add on top of that the dopamine agonist because again, the, the common precursor cell, um, these are all acidophils, uh, do respond to this. And so you can get 25 to 30% improvement with addition of cabergoline. Um, more uh, recently, we've developed pigmephysamon, which is a growth hormone receptor blocker. Um, and so you can normalize IGF-1 levels uh, in about two-thirds of patients. So interestingly, in the pivotal study that was used to approve it, it was almost 100% effective. And then when they looked at the post-market data, it was almost 62% effective. Funny how that works. Um, Passereotide is a ligand, so sometimes these are combined. So the idea is, is that you knock down the production of growth hormone, and then whatever growth hormone escapes that initial agent, you block the receptor to knock down the production of IGF-1. I think it was, yeah, I think it was uh, patient selection more than anything. I think they were very selective during the pivotal, pivotal trial. Yeah. You know, what happened um, was there were pretty strict criteria for the use of pigvisimont during the trial. And then when it was on label, basically every endocrinologist said, hey, we finally have an agent and just gave it to everybody, whether they met the study criteria or not, as long as they had acromegaly, um, which that happens all the time with, with, with every kind of drug. Um, as I mentioned, there's no currently no clear role for uh, medical management only as primary therapy, um, but it does work. And there have been some studies that report reduction in tumor size, similar to the use of dopamine agonists and prolactinoma. So I think eventually, similar to prolactin secreting tumors, this will become primarily a medical <coughs> disease, but we're not there yet. Um, and as I mentioned, there's no clear role yet for neoadjuvant therapy.
Um, Non-functioning adenomas. Oh, Peter. So, what do you think? Um, so, I think the first question is, what is the indication, right? So, if they've had radio surgery and they still have excess levels in their pan hypo pit. Um, your goal of surgery is to try to get a biochemical cure. A lot of that's going to depend on where the tumor is, right? So if they had radio surgery initially because it was invasive and not a good surgical candidate, they're not necessarily still going to be a surgical, good surgical candidate. Um, and that's ignoring whether or not you think that operating after radiation is harder. Um, you know, I've had patients where they've been radiated and it's not harder, and I've had patients where it's radiated and they've been harder. What I have consistently found is that if they've been on long-term medical therapy, and this is true for both the prolactinomas and the acromegalics, and you go in, the tumor is very, very fibrotic. It doesn't have the consistency of a normal adenoma and becomes much more difficult to remove. Um, so current indications for operation on an incidentaloma or non-functioning adenoma, and these are based on the Congress of Neurological Surgeons uh, uh, Joint Guidelines Committee um, uh, guidelines that came out last year, and I was uh, part of the group that developed those. So if you have somebody with documented visual deficits or optic compressions, if you have documented tumor expansion over serial MRIs, uh, if they've developed hypopituitarism as a result of compression of the normal gland. Unremitting headache uh, is also considered an indication because more than 70% of these patients' headaches will improve with resection. Uh, or if they have a, a non-functioning adenoma and a planned pregnancy, and the reason for that is the normal gland will hypertrophy to two to three times its normal size uh, rather acutely after the onset of of conception. And so if they have a large non-functioning tumor already, and then you have an acute doubling or tripling of the size of the normal gland, you can develop symptoms that are similar to apoplexy in terms of acute vision loss. Uh, the other issue is that at the time of delivery, there is, uh, by uh, normal spontaneous vaginal delivery, a risk of apoplexy due to swings in blood pressure. Um, the outcomes are good. Uh, 75 to 85 percent of patients will improve uh, in terms of their visual fields. Um, restoring normal pituitary function is pretty dismal, 13 to 25 percent. So what I tell patients when I'm operating on them for any reason is that I have a 5 percent chance of, of injuring your normal pituitary function. So if they have normal function, they come in, they have a 5 percent chance with a selective resection of losing additional pituitary function long-term. But if they don't have function and they're looking for function to be restored, you know, 25% at best is, is what their chances are. Um, for non-functioning adenomas and cysts, the headache resolution's up to 90%. With the functioning adenomas, it's lower because there seems to be a biochemical uh, process involved in inflammation of the dura in that region that leads to their headache as opposed to just a pure pressure phenomenon. Um, and the recurrence rate for non-functioning adenomas, it depends on what data you look at. Uh, some people say about 5% at 10 years. Um, I say it's up to 1% per year. So if you have, you know, a 30-year-old patient, you take a non-functioning adenoma and their life expectancy is 85 they've got a 55% chance over their lifetime that they're going to have some recurrence. Now, whether you need to do anything about it or not is a different story. Right, and so that's where you get these, you know, lovely pictures that look like this um, three months post-op. And I think in the interest of time, so people can get down to the OR, I'm going to stop here, um, but I'm happy to take any additional questions.